It's part of the routine. It's part of being in a church. Actually, I reflect on my history, and I came up with my top ten memories of growing up Adventist. By no means is this all conclusive, and not all of you will recognize them, but many of you will. For example, my number one reason to share with you is in-gathering. Some, oh, somebody knows. That's a time between Thanksgiving and Christmas when you encourage, coerce, or threaten the church membership to take a little blue can that says community service, and if you're lucky, you had one with a candle on it, and you go door to door, mapped out, nobody duplicates, inviting the community to support the community services of the Adventist church. And it was very effective, although the sideline comment among all pastors is there's only one tolerated murder in heaven, and that's when the Adventist pastors meet Jasper Wayne. Those of you who know Jasper Wayne, he was the one that was considered the father of ingathering, but he never planned it that way. Number two, I remember growing up, growing up Adventist, instead of trick-or-treating on Halloween, is put on your Pathfinder uniform and collect canned goods from door to door. I remember that well. Number three, growing up Adventist included regular attendance to Friday Vesper programs. Uh, we lived in an area where that was provided, and that was good. Number four, growing up Adventist, I always made sure I had my Sabbath bath well before the sun set. That was routine, cleaning the house as well. I laugh now, but I realize how influential cleaning the house before Sabbath was when years ago I had beat the rest of the family home but Connie brought in the family. Rebecca came through the door first, and then her brother Noah. I was already actively involved preparing the house for Sabbath. It's cleaning time. Suit, tie, can of pledge, and a vacuum. And I was moving through that house. Rebecca came through the door, and before I could say hello, she turned to her brother and said, Noah, Dad's cleaning the house in a suit and tie. Go to your room. Okay, she knew not to get in the way. Later, everything was good. That was a particularly stressful day, but the routine was there. Number five, growing up Adventist, I knew that hikes with bird watching on Sabbath was good, but for some reason, swimming and looking at the fish was unacceptable. <laughs> Number six, growing up as an Adventist, I discovered the difference between haystacks in the barn and haystacks at the church potluck. Number seven, speaking of potlucks, Growing up Adventist, I became very familiar with Special K and a Special K loaf, which was a staple for a long time within our Adventist church. And by the way, somebody after first service said, yeah, I just had some last Sabbath. So it still works. Speaking of food, growing up Adventist meant if you opened the right cupboard, you would see a line of Worthington, Cedar Lake, and Loma Linda substitute meat products, usually for Sabbath because they were special and had to be planned. Number eight, or number nine, I attended Adventist schools and I learned to distinguish between dancing and marching. <laughs> Some of the older generation know exactly what I mean. I became familiar with Chapel record labels and I had the privilege of being able to see and thus I memorized much of the approved movie list for Adventist education. Number 10, Growing up Adventist meant I don't smoke and I don't chew and I would never go out with a girl that does. Okay, that's my top 10 list. And you could add to it, some of you recognize these same lists of items. Some of you say, what? I never heard that before. But we each have our list of what it means to grow up Adventist. Not all are going to understand. Not all identify the same. But as much as I can reminisce, smile, and even laugh at times, I grew up Adventist, and I'm glad to say that I did. Why? Because growing up Adventist has been my life. It has produced my training. It has become my traditions. And it has also become a protection from some very dangerous things. Being born an Adventist, I was born as a fourth generation in my family line. I attended Sabbath schools every week without fault. Church was a part of life. I learned every memory verse every Sabbath and every 
13th Sabbath, I would stand up with all my friends in front of the church during the adult Sabbath school and recite all the memory verses. How many of you remember that day? And I'm, I'm again, referring to those who have been around for a while longer. Four years, or for eight years, I attended Adventist education, grades one through eight. For another four years, I went through Adventist high school, which we call academy. And then on to college, Pacific Union College for me, and after graduation, straight to Andrews University, where I pursued my Master's of Divinity in theology so I could be a well-prepared pastor. Never known public school. Never attended. This is my Adventist traditions. By the way, does this make me more holy or advantaged over others? Because I'm a fourth-generation Adventist, does that mean I'm closer to the kingdom? No. What does it mean then? I've often wondered, if I was so protected in growing up Adventist, was I disadvantaged not having proper perspective? I have friends who had perspective. Willis Dagenet fellow pastor in the Iowa Conference. First appointment for me, and I became acquainted with Willis. Willis had become a Seventh-day Adventist pastor after quite a story of working for the Mafia. New York City. He was white-collar. He drove the fancy cars. He had the armed guards. He saw hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash go through his hand every day. It's quite the story how he got out of the mafia with their blessing and became an Adventist pastor. Fact remains, he said, I can call today and I would have people here to do my bidding this evening if I should so desire. Quite the story. A trophy story for the Lord. And then how about Ron Halverson? Some of you knew him. He passed away a couple years ago. But his story is amazing. I remember growing up with the story. He's living up on the northeast area in the city, part of a gang, running for his life, and he ducks into the first building where the doors are open to find safety, and he did not knowing it would change his life. It was an Adventist school. And he became introduced to Jesus Christ at an Adventist academy. Changed his life. He became a very, very well-known and powerful preacher for Jesus. Another trophy but I'm not a trophy. I don't have a story like that to tell. So I guess the question is, what is the advantage of growing up in the Adventist church? Do I have one? Do I need a wild story to give perspective? Or are there advantages for being part of a church family and growing up Adventist? I'd like to suggest three reasons why there is an advantage. The first, and if you uh, have your Bible and would like to join me, is Proverbs 22, verse 6. It's on page 464. If you care to follow along and use the page numbers, page 464 is the book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 6, a text I'm going to wager most of you have heard. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Heard that text? Oh, I heard it many a time. Train a child in gathering. Okay, that was part of it. Canned food collection. Never thought about that as being important in training me in the Lord, but I realize now, looking back, that was an introduction and a help for me to prepare for ministry, what it would be all about, a perspective, a focus. How about the memory verses that I would stand up in front as a child and recite? And all the memory verses I had to learn for my quizzes and Bible tests coming all the way through grade school and into academy, and yes, even in college and the seminary, we were required to memorize Scripture, and I used to despise that requirement because of all the time. But guess what? Those are the texts I recite now. And whether you remember it or not, there's another text in Scripture. It's Ephesians 6. You can read the entire passage, verses 6 through 12. But at the very end, Scripture, Paul, he says that memory verses are the sword in our spiritual armor. And it's the Word of God. And the Word is the rhema, which translates simply into memory verses. Does it work? 
Well, ask Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. That's exactly what he did when Satan tempted him. He quoted memory verses, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and Deuteronomy chapter 6. He didn't argue. He didn't fight. He quoted the rhema, the memory verses from Scripture, and Satan could do nothing. And I realized all those memory verses in my growing up years, all the quizzes and tests that I became so despising, became my anchor to defeat Satan. I guess growing up Adventist and having that training wasn't so bad. I never forget the way I was taught, the promise. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will never turn. By the way, it doesn't say that we're always going to follow everything people tell us to do. But you can never forget the way you were trained. Decisions are yours. Mom and dad give training and direction, and you will lean on that. Now, that's a message for the young people. But for you older folk, realize how important it is to train in the way of the Lord. Now I am old and I can't forget that is the promise of scripture it doesn't say everyone is going to never disagree but it says we can never forget I was given training I was given options to choose from I was given reasons to believe and I'm so grateful for it the second reason why growing up Adventist has value is what I call traditions but I borrow that from the Apostle Paul it's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's page 812. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, page 812. These are the words. Read verse 2. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the teachings by the word, the word teaching there often is translated tradition. By holding to the traditions, just as I pass them on to you. I praise you for remembering me and holding to the traditions. Traditions are often considered negative. That's not necessarily the intent. They aren't meant to be bad. They can be, if they keep us from growing in Christ. But Paul praised the Christians for holding on to traditions. They had value. And I think about my traditions. And I praise the Lord for what they have been. My Sabbath bath before I was able to even reason. My mom and dad made sure I was ready for Sabbath. What was that doing? It was preparing me to realize Jesus wanted to meet me on a very special time that he promised rest. I had no concept of it, but the traditions now translate into why. That was so important. And here I am, looking forward to Sabbath, preparing my mind and my body, if necessary, to meet the Lord. Not a bad tradition. Haystacks and special kalo are traditions too. I can't say they're moral or immoral. There's not a good or a bad unless you don't like them or you really like them. Take your pick. It's not bad to have good traditions that anchor us to the family. And by the way, special kalo, if you Google that, it comes up to a Seventh-day Adventist recipe. That's exactly what it's called. Special Seventh-day Adventist special kalo. That's the title you'll find. Even sociologist Tony Campolo he said, traditions are what keep the church together. It's the bond. It's the way we do things. It's an identity. It's who we are. Traditions are so important. As family, do you have traditions? As church, we need to hold to the traditions. Are they moral laws? Not always. Sometimes, maybe. But they're ever so important. And number three, growing up Adventist was about protection. The text I'd like to read is Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's page 130. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with the very first verse. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Notice, recite the teaching, the observation. Slip down to verse, verse 6 through 9. Here's what the, the Lord is telling Moses to reveal to the people. 
beginning with verse 6. These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down, when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Hmm. Impress, talk, when walking or lying down, when you're getting up, it pretty well encompasses all of life, wouldn't you say? These commands of the Lord were to be taught. For what reason? That they may live long and be protected against all the heresies and all the devious things that they might be taught from other sources. And I think to myself, is that not what my Adventist heritage is all about? Growing up Adventist, mom and dad wanted to protect me, so I laugh with the joke, I don't smoke and I don't chew, I don't go out with girls that do. You must think I have no fun. I don't. We quoted that all the time and laughed, and I thought that was an Adventist phrase, a cliche that we created. Just found out. Now we got it from the Baptists. They had the same concerns. Wow. That was a protection. Why? I am so glad that I don't smoke and chew. I don't have that habit to deal with. I'm told it's one of the worst habits to break. I don't have to deal with that. I'm not worried about a dad who's drunk and who spends a lot of the money on alcohol because we didn't have that. That was a protection. And I can go through a long list of things that have been protecting me from things that I had to deal with later, but I was ready for it, and I didn't have addictions to deal with. I'm so glad my health habits are still short of perfection at times, yet I'm glad that I am associated with the Blue Zones and Loma Linda University. 98% Adventist in that little community, but they still pull rank on health, and people know it. You can consider it any way you wish. I'm glad I'm associated with them. Ah, oh, I'm protected. Yeah, not bad. By the way, it was my teachers who influenced me in regard to things like music. They didn't tell me how to live my life, but we had plenty of discussions, and they introduced me to good options. I remember so well the day I was invited to go to the home of a friend, a good friend. He had just purchased, I found out, a big vinyl record of Jesus Christ Superstar. Some of you remember that Broadway play. It was the gospel in rock and roll. Interesting that it was written, the music was written by Andrew Lloyd Webber, a very well-known composer. The words were written by Tim Rice, and i really be honest with you, don't know who he is, 1970. And as I sat down and they began to play a rock and roll rendition of the gospel, my mind was conflicted. I'm not going to tell you what is right or what is wrong, and I've looked at that song list since. The gospel is there, but the vehicle, is it right, is it wrong? I don't hear judge anybody. All I know is I had to make a decision. Where did I get the decision-making skills, whether they be agreed with or disagreed with by others? It came from my Adventist growing up. It was the teachers, the people who influenced me that helped me have the capability to make a decision. Too often times, people aren't making any decisions thinking it doesn't matter. It does matter. You have to decide where that line is on so many of the issues, but it was my growing up Adventists that gave me some of the weapons to use in deciding. The approved list of movies, oh, I always wanted to be on that committee. They never, ever asked me to join. But today, how do you decide the movies and the entertainment industry's impression on you? Is there a reason to decide? Well, just a little clue. R-rated movies doesn't stand for religious. Keep it in mind. There's a problem with growing up Adventist. No, it's not the training. It's not the traditions. It is not the protection. But there is a problem, and it's spoken of in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 9 to 12. I am watching the clock, and I am aware of the time, and we're getting to the close. I want you to hear this text very well. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Remember all that love stuff that's written in the chapter? Not bad, but that's not the focus here. It's verse 9. For we know in part... We prophesy in part, 
But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. Paul knew what this was about. He says we're like a child. We know in part. We have a poor reflection now. Actually, one of the words, um, King James says we see in a mirror dimly. The word dimly is translated as distorted in one translation. And it makes sense because the mirrors they had were often polished brass and they were anything but a clear picture. There was always a little bit of a wave or a ripple and that meant the picture of your face reflecting back was distorted. Paul understood this. We see things distorted. We don't have the full picture. John picked up that theme in 1 John 3 in the second verse. He says, dear friends, now we are children of God. And I'm so glad for that promise. What we will be has not yet been made known, and I can't disagree with that. I know I'm God's child, but what does he have planned for me? Where am I going to be next year, next decade, maybe when I get old? Where are we going to be? We don't know, except we'll be like him, because that's the promise of Scripture. When Jesus comes, the imperfect puts on perfection, the corruptible puts on incorruption. The Lord's got a plan. All I know is where I am right now, but there's a journey, and I can't see clearly where that's going to lead, except for it will lead me to the kingdom. So I'm growing. That's the important thing to realize, and that is the problem. Here's why I say that. Whether my journey with Jesus began as a fourth-generation Adventist, or whether it just began in the last several months, We're in a process of becoming like Jesus. We are growing. We have to continue in this process. But my experience with too many is that they rely upon what they learned in high school and academies and at their baptism to govern their life now, and it seems like they stopped growing too long before. You see, the problem with growing up Adventists is that we stop growing. You're going to tell me that the list is decided now? Who wrote your list? The pastors? Your mom and dad? The school officials? If that's the case, nobody would be wearing blue jeans in church. Maybe it's the general conference that has that authority. Or maybe I'm growing in Jesus and he will give me an understanding every step of the way with what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, what is right, what is wrong, because I'm finding very few specifics that tells me how to live my life. But I see a lot of principles that guide and govern. When I was teaching for 16 years and youth pastoring 13 years later, this book became a favorite of mine about a long time ago. It's called Cows, Tails, and Cobras. It's a book about ropes courses, rock climbing adventures, and how they can be used to create a teachable moment. And that teachable moment, we often refer to it as a learning experience. You create an environment that has a pseudo problem and the kids get to solve them. I oftentimes would pick up and try some innovative things. Every year when I'd ask the kids to review my teaching for the year, one particular class always came up. They said, it's the day you cussed in class. Okay, that's how they referred to it, and I had permission. It was with the principal's approval, but we would list the cuss words. Did you know in 1 Peter 4, verse 11, Peter said, and by the way, he knew what he was saying, if you're going to speak, say the very words Jesus would say. Now, he's talking about sermons, but the secondary application could easily be our choice of terminology. So I confronted the students, and we listed every cuss word they had heard on campus, for I was teaching on a campus. There were 40 words I'd never heard before. I don't know if they were cuss words or not. They said they were. I have to believe them. Listed them out. And when we were done talking about these things, they said, yeah, okay, fine, but what are you going to say when somebody, or when you hit your finger with a hammer? What do you say? Good question. What do you say? Because I know we all have frustrations. I suggested they say flowers. 
Yeah, and that's exactly what they did. They laughed. And they said, yeah, you're right. And I said, and you won't get kicked out of school. You won't get in trouble. And nobody's going to feel bad. It was two weeks later. I think I told you this story, but those of you who are a guest haven't heard it. Two weeks later, final game for the intramural softball league between the faculty team and this other very good team. It was the seventh inning. It was the bottom of the seventh inning. Faculty were ahead, one run. Bases are loaded. There are two outs, and it was full count. Three balls, two strikes. One pitch left in the game. If this kid hits a hit, they're going to win the game. If he strikes out, they're going to lose. And the kid that stood up to hit the ball was the one who had the worst mouth in the school, and everybody knew it. He had been in trouble numerous times, and he gets up to swing. He was a good ball player. Pitch came. He swung hard. Complete miss. Faculty win. And the place was absolutely silent. And in the midst of the silence, flowers. The place fell apart. The kids were pounding their feet on the, on the bleachers. I was laying at shortstop making puddles with my drool. I was laughing so hard. It was hilarious. And he never got kicked out of school. Everybody laughed. Everybody felt good. And nobody really cared who won that crazy league anyway. We were just having a good time. Creative learning. I'm going to tell you something. This is life. Not contrived by teachers or pastors. For think for a minute, three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Kneel down, bow down, and worship the image. He said, uh-uh, ain't going to happen. It isn't going to happen. And he told the king in so many words, our God is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we're not going to serve your gods. Where did he get the stamina and the courage to stand firm on their convictions if it wasn't for the way they grew up trusting the Lord. And that's not the only experience. How about Daniel? He's faced with a lion's den. Does he change his way of living? Does he stop praying to the God that he has come to rely on? No. He knows he's heading to the lion's den, but he does it anyway. You want to talk about a cow's tail? There it was. There's nothing to say anything. Go down the list. How about Joseph? Confronted with a sexual temptation by Potiphar's wife, he knew he was going to be the loser no, ma no matter what. You want to talk about a cobra? It's ready to strike. He stands firm. The rest of the story we have in history of Scripture, God delivered him. Samuel, just a young boy, chosen by God to be a messenger. He heard God's voice speaking to him. How would you respond if God spoke to you directly or indirectly? And then there's Rahab and Jesus' mother Mary. Oh, that was a good story. How about Gideon, Barak? And you can go through the list. There's a lot of them. All of them are facing the same cobras and cow's tails all the time, having to make decisions. How did they get the courage to stand firm? So much of it came from the way they grew up. They were trained. They had traditions. They were protected. They were given the tools to use. Francis Chan, a well-known writer, said, A lot of us need to forget about God's will for our life. God cares more about our response to His Spirit's leading today, in this moment, than about what He's intending to do for you in the future. He's not denying God's leading and His will for your life. He said, let's put the focus where it belongs, though, right now. It's okay to learn from the past. Growing up Adventist has been very good for me, and I will never, never discourage anybody from that. But I have to pray and hope for the future, because that's where I'm going. I know what I am now, a child of God, forgiven by His grace. I know that He's working in me to change me through and through. Philippians 2, verse 13, is God who works in me both to will and to do. And I'm so grateful. What will He take me to be? I don't know. I'm not there yet. I just know I'm still growing. That's the important thing. I know where I am now, but it's not yet determined. So I amend my top ten list. And here's what I like to suggest growing up Adventist means. Growing up Adventist means you are passionate about daily worship. Growing up Adventist means that people ask you to pray for them because they know you will. Growing up Adventist means that others use you as a reference for a healthy lifestyle. Growing up Adventist means that your name is a synonym for compassion and care. Growing up Adventist means to use your time and your money to help those who need help even before they ask. 
Growing up Adventist means you practice what you preach, but you never judge somebody else for thinking different. Growing up Adventist means that Jesus is the motive for everything that your life is involved in. See, that's what growing up Adventist is all about. So when I talk about growing up Adventist, I come to realize it's not just my history. It's not just my traditions. It's not just my training. It's my life. Growing up Adventist? Well, I guess I still am. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're on a journey. We happen to have a title for our particular brand of the journey. We call it Adventist, but it's really all about you. We are your children. You've made that certain. And being your children, you've promised to take us to the kingdom and that we will be like you. But how we get to that point, that's the surprise. That's what we face every day. May we face it honestly with commitment and dedication to you. And may we, growing up as Adventists, have a reason for what we believe, an identity with you that changes everything. And I thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.